What causes scoliosis? When patients receive a diagnosis of scoliosis, it's a scoliosis itself as a diagnosis is almost too general because we know there's different types of scoliosis associated with different causes. And these types, and the most common types, are something called idiopathic scoliosis, something called neuromuscular scoliosis, something called degenerative scoliosis, congenital scoliosis, and the last uh, being traumatic scoliosis. Now, the most common type of scoliosis is something called idiopathic scoliosis. Idiopathic literally means unknown cause. It means that we do not clearly understand or associate a single cause or a causative source for that patient actually having scoliosis. And in fact, we consider idiopathic scoliosis to be something called multifactorial, meaning there could be many reasons why a patient would develop scoliosis. Idiopathic scoliosis accounts for about 80% of all diagnosis cases. However, the other 20% of cases do have known causes, and those are the other four that I mentioned, and that is neuromuscular scoliosis, degenerative scoliosis, congenital, and traumatic scoliosis. So what are some known causes associated with the other four? Neuromuscular scoliosis is probably the second largest category, and this is where scoliosis is caused by the presence of a larger underlining neuromuscular condition. Normally, these neuromuscular conditions can affect the soft tissues of the body, and connective tissues of the body like the muscles, ligaments, or can affect the nerve system itself like the spinal cord. Degenerative scoliosis is caused by age-related spinal degeneration associated either from unresolved adolescent idiopathic scoliosis or some type of small trauma that left, left, left unresolved in that area of the spine deteriorates faster than the rest of the spine causing a scoliosis to occur in that area. The hallmark feature of these uh, cases is going to be degeneration at the site of scoliosis like disc degeneration, bone degeneration, and we, we normally see that type of deterioration occurring faster in that area than the rest. Congenital scoliosis is when scoliosis develops actually in utero, and it happens as a result of there being a malformed bone within the spine itself. Normally, this bone is called a hemivertebra, and sometimes patients can have multiple hemivertebras, not just one. And instead of the vertebra or the spinal bone being like a rectangle, it actually shaped like a triangle. And this triangle or wedge-shaped vertebra will cause a curvature to occur right at that site. Again, this is the way you're born. You're born this way. You don't develop congenital scoliosis as an adult, you only develop it in utero and you're born like that. Traumatic scoliosis is scoliosis that's caused by some kind of trauma or injury. Now, it's a little different than degenerative scoliosis because normally the trauma causes the scoliosis to occur immediately, where degenerative scoliosis may cause a small shift, but then it's the degeneration over time that will lead to the greater scoliosis. Now, when it comes to scoliosis, if you don't know what causes scoliosis, can, the, people think, well, there's just no way that you can treat it. Well, the truth of the matter is that is completely untrue. We may not know exactly what causes idiopathic scoliosis. And in fact, most of the cases that I mentioned before, above are treated like idiopathic scoliosis because despite the cause of scoliosis, what all scoliosis have in common is that they become structural. And once they become structural, they start leading to the structural deviation of the spine, meaning even if you knew what caused it, and even if you corrected the cause that, that, that led to the scoliosis, the curve itself is not changing. The curve itself is still there. You still need to treat the scoliosis as a separate entity. And we know this to be 100% true because when we look at the, what multifactorial means when it comes to scoliosis treatment, because idiopathic scoliosis is direct, definitely associated with being a multifactorial problem very commonly, just like neuromuscular conditions are. They tend to be multifactorial problems. When you have a neuromuscular syndrome, something like Marfan's, you can have ligament laxity, you can have connective tissue disorders in your heart and your eye, and sometimes that leads to scoliosis. All the three components of Marfan syndromes are treated individually. You treat the cardiovascular problem as a cardiovascular problem, treat the eye problem as an eye problem, treat the, the scoliosis as a scoliosis. You don't treat Marfan syndrome, you treat every component of the syndrome separately. And that's the same thing true when it comes to scoliosis. Idiopathic scoliosis may have a multifactorial causation that actually led to your scoliosis. This can be genetic, it can be familiar, it can be lifestyle, it can be environmental, and this can vary from one person to the next, and it can be more than one, one, one factor associated with more and more people. But regardless of us knowing what causes it, we know that once the scoliosis starts and as the curve progresses, the curve itself becomes structural, meaning if you could figure out all the things that were involved that caused the scoliosis and corrected it, 
the curve is still there. You have to treat the curve now and reduce the curve because the curve now structurally affects the spine. So therefore, when you want to treat scoliosis, the best way to treat it is something called proactive treatment. And this is normally proactive treatment that's driven by the causation, meaning the, the structural causation associated with scoliosis. When it comes to idiopathic scoliosis, the goal is to stay ahead of the progressive nature, meaning we know it progresses rapidly during adolescent stage, and as it progresses rapidly during an adolescent stage, it can progress very, very quickly and lead to severe changes in the size of curve rapidly over time, or rapidly over a very short time. But it also can progress in the adult stage and it progresses slowly in the adult stage as a result of compression. And this slow progression accelerates or snowballs as the curve gets bigger and as the patient ages. So both these things as lead to unfortunate, relentless progression as a result of scoliosis. So the more you can stay in front of the progressive nature of scoliosis, the greater chance you have of having a great outcome. There are two rules of thumb when it comes to treating scoliosis. The smaller the curve, the better the results of treatment. The younger the patient, the better results with, results with treatment. So therefore, watching and waiting your curve and watching it worsen will only, only typically only lead to a more negative result in, in your conservative treatment approach. So we recommend treating curves as quickly and as proactively as possible. We know different condition types have different causations and possibly different treatment needs, but the bottom line says you want to reduce the size of curve to have so scoliosis can have the least amount of impact on the health and longevity of your body, especially as you move in from the adolescent stage into the adult form. So we always recommend a scoliosis reduction center being proactive and dealing, and dealing with the curve itself because by the time you normally diagnose scoliosis, the cause of the, all the problems is the size of curve. So by reducing the curve is really you're starting to address really what's causing the results or the problems associated with your scoliosis. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like to hear about other topics and information on scoliosis, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish content. Thanks.